Our scripture today is from Luke 18, 9 through 14. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that, I'm not, that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Then our psalm is 84, 1 through 7. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They, grow, they go from strength to strength. The, the God of gods will be seen in Zion. The word of God for the people of God. Now, I told you some last week about when I worked for the night ministry and how it changed my life and uh, how it just made me partly who I am today. And part of the things that we did as night ministers was we never told anyone what to believe. We just listened to what they wanted us to hear, and then we talked to them about it. But it's, it's easy to listen to people, but, and sometimes not so easy to tell them what to believe. Because, but everyone has a belief system of their own, even if they don't have a name for their God. On the nighttime streets, sorry, people just float around and around me and in and out of my life. They appeared and they disappeared, but they knew they could trust me because I did not judge them. And I knew that I too had my faults. And I knew that as hard as it was for me to believe sometimes, that I too was forgiven. There were other religious groups working in the neighborhoods too. But the difference was that they had certain criteria people had to meet, certain beliefs to be discussed before they could listen to anyone, before they would let people reserve services. You can come into this coffee house and get a cup of coffee, but you have to read our information and you have to understand the nature of sin. Or you can have a bed here at our huge homeless shelter but you have to attend worship service first, except that you are a sinner and pay your dues for being homeless. Do as we say, follow our rules or you can't come in. Those kinds of requirements don't necessarily save anyone's soul and can be harmful. We felt that we were not there to judge why someone was homeless, homeless but to listen and then offer help if it was wanted. Those standards were rigid that the other folks had, and there was not much room, wiggle room with their God that they had put in a box. And they seemed to think us nice night ministers were as lost as the homeless folks on the street. We didn't think so, though. In our scripture today, Jesus is talking about the righteous Pharisee and the despised tax collector. Now, at first reading, it seems obvious that the Pharisee is supposed to be the bad guy and the tax collector is the good guy. But Jesus doesn't say that to us. He lets us decide for ourselves while at the same time telling a seemingly simple story 
with many layers. We know by now that any parable that Jesus teaches always has a hidden meaning and often switches around what you think you think you should think <laughs> and what Jesus actually is saying. He is not condemning all Pharisees, nor is he lifting up all tax collectors. He is telling us to expect the unexpected. The Pharisee was doing what was required by law to be a good Pharisee. The tax man had obviously done some rotten things in his life. The difference is not really between their stations in life, but in the way that they prayed, in the way that they presented themselves to God. The Pharisee was centered on himself, doing the right things, but leaving a sincere with a relationship with God out of the prayer. The other, acknowledging himself as a sinner, opens himself to God's tender mercies and places God at the center of his life falling freely into God's depth of love and its mystery. Most of us have probably, from time to time, put ourselves in the place of the Pharisee. We might do the right things, attend the socially acceptable church, give money, have successful lives in the eyes of the world. And who among us has not said from time to time, as did the Pharisee, I'm glad I'm not that guy. When things are going good for us, we tend to think it's because we are doing the right things, working the plan, justified in our faith because we are always so good at what we do, and God approves. But that attitude tends, tends to leave all our success in our own hands, thinking that we are successful because God is blessing our efforts, yet leaving God out of the center of our lives and our being. On the other hand, it's also easy to wallow in your despair, to think you are cursed by God, to think that you will never be any better. This is also putting yourself at the center and leaving out God. Because it's not really about what we have or who we are that makes us precious in the eyes of God. It's about having a God-centered life, no matter who you are or what you do. It's about being humbly aware that your life is other-directed and that your place in life, your success or failure, does not change who you are and our God's love for you or for everyone around you. This means everyone, rich, poor, male, female, adult, child. Having, it's still all about God being at the center of your life. Having humility is not about feeling worthless and thinking you have nothing to offer. Having humility is turning all that you are, your whole being, over to God, letting God guide your footsteps along the way. Now, I admit it's a hard thing to do and scary, and we're not perfect, and sometimes we forget. And sometimes we stumble and fall. We are so used to feeling in charge and thinking we have all the answers while at all the time God is there working and doing in our lives and in the world. The Pharisees did, the Pharisee did what was required of him by law. The tax collector did what was required of him by God, give himself over to God with humility, exposing his need and his belief that God was there for him. That doesn't mean that God quit loving the Pharisee or loved the tax collector more. It's just that the Pharisee had a lot more to learn than he could even imagine or that he was even aware that he had something to learn. We need to learn to live God's love in our loving and grace-filled relationships with others. Because God loves us, we are free to love to share all that God's love means with people in our lives. We are free to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Holy, holiness, being justified by the one who calls us to be holy, even as God is holy, is living in love alongside other flawed, struggling human beings who are seeking to know the sacred. And it is lived in solidarity with the poor a wonderful and radical way of, be, of being. 
So let's talk about prayer. Prayer is mysterious. Why do we pray? What is it? Does God hear us? Why do, God, why do we not want to do it? Why are we uncomfortable about prayer? The Pharisee thought he had all the answers. He was sure he had followed all the rules and ticked every box, and he had. But where was his heart? Where was God in his life? He had a smug sense of superiority and played by the rules, but had a great gaping space in his heart where God should have been. The tax collector didn't know any of the rules. He didn't even want to be near the temple. He only has the ache in his heart to offer God. And Jesus tells it like it is. Throw out the rules, he says. Open your heart and God will hear you. We have a hunger for holiness, a hunger for, for prayer, a thirst for prayer. Our reading in, in the Psalms talks about rejoicing in God and about giving thanks and the joy that God brings into your life. And there are many ways to pray. pray. The, the poet Mary Oliver said she found prayer in the world around her, in all living creatures. Listen to this poem of hers called Thirst. Another morning and I woke with thirst for the goodness I do not have. I walk out to the pond and all the way God has given me such beautiful lessons. Oh Lord, I was never a quick scholar, but soaked and hunched over my books past the hour and the bell. Grant me in your mercy a little more time. Love for the earth and love for you are having such a long conversation in my heart. Who knows what will finally happen or where I will be sent. Yet already I have been given a great many things away, expecting to be told to pack nothing except the prayers, which with this thirst I am slowly learning. Oliver said that it was outdoors where she often prayed, in God's great temple of the natural world. She said she learned from the prayers of all the other creatures how to be a praying being. Yet in church, she also worked on coming to God in bread and wine and her own wandering attention. Perhaps prayer is what we do with our own lives when we pay attention beyond ourselves. Look around you. It's the fall of the year. The farmers are harvesting their crops, and that is a prayer. The children are playing in the autumn leaves, and that is a prayer. Reading a good book is a prayer. Writing a poem or a song and then sharing it is a prayer. Our work of loving and sharing, giving love and receiving it, whether it be to a beloved child, a stranger, your community of hope and shared belief, or asking healing for a broken heart, a broken soul, all this is prayer. Life, when closely observed and held dear, is a prayer of thanks, of goodness, of fears relieved and given over, of falling into the great love and acceptance and of our nurturing God. It's all prayer if we take the time to pay attention. In this sense, our prayer never really ends. Prayer is not always easy. But prayer doesn't have to be elaborate, merely from the heart. A, a prayer can be as simple as help me or thank you. It can be alone or with others. It can be outside under a tree or in the stillness of a dark night or as simple as shutting the door of, at your office at work and taking a little time to be with God. It can be in a car, in the shower, or, of course, in church. Jesus wrestled with demons and sweated blood, and so do we from time to time. Jesus often went to a garden or to a holy stone. He prayed with friends and strangers by touching and listening and being God's love in a hurt and crippled world full of fear. And he continues to do so today through us as we pray for our hurt and crippled world so often full of fear. 
If we begin to understand that life is prayer and prayer is life, then we can understand what Jesus meant about how to pray. Just fall into it. Immerse yourself and open your heart and mind and being to God. Whether it's a cry of pain or loss or a cry of joy and celebration, God is there listening, helping us, holding us, forgiving us and accepting us for who we are and loving us without end. Amen.